trick this morning. We have uh, Dee Teal. She's from Melbourne, uh, where she is now. She's originally a Kiwi. Uh, she's been involved in the WordPress Press community since around 2008 as a blogger. Uh, she's been on the forums with uh, Studio Press Genesis, if anyone knows uh, that team framework. Um, and she's been a freelance developer as well. She's been involved in the community for a, uh, for a long time. And uh, she is now a human. So she is uh, working for a uh, large company, uh, Human Made, one of our sponsors. And she's um, management team as a uh, project manager. So she is here to talk to us today about project management, principles to improve your work, life, and uh, mental health. So put your hands together for you here. Thanks, Nick. I'm impressed. I really thought first up on Sunday would mean an empty room, so um, thanks for coming out. I really appreciate it. Like Nick said, I'm mostly known around the web princess. Um, I'm also now working for Human Made. So, how many of you, is this a familiar feeling? <coughs> that paralyzing, incapacitating dread when the amount that you have to do seems to exceed your capacity. What about this one? I reckon there's something about this guy that's trying to explain to a client why the project isn't running on schedule. Alrighty. I'll just move the mic a little bit further away. Okay, what about this feeling? I reckon this guy is explaining why the project isn't running on schedule. Um, it's tough when you've got other people relying, you on the, relying on you on the other end of the line and you're trying to explain what's going on and what you really want to say to them is, look, I can talk to you about this or I can get off and finish your project. Um, of course, we're nice, nice people. We're not actually going to do that. But with every call, every challenge, the anxiety and the stress gets higher. Or there's this one. You're going crazy with this feedback. Finally, uh, the pressure of all directions and increasing anxiety about what you need to do, the time you have to do it in, and the expectations of the people around you to just get the stuff done. So in this session, we're going to talk about some of the simple ways that I've learned uh, in managing large projects to break down and organise what you have or what you need to do to reduce some of that stress and anxiety. To save and even actually make time and to get back that feeling of having made order out of chaos. Some of these tips may help you manage the projects of your freelance business. Some of them may even be applicable in managing per personal projects, like organising a renovation or planning a wedding or getting the details down on some travel that you want to do. So in the course of this, we're going to look at seven elements of project management that I've come across and can be applied in more than just software or client projects that can help bring order to chaos. And those are analyse, visualise, Prioritise, iterate, complete, review, and reflect. Now, don't panic. You're probably looking at that and going, seven, I'll never be able to handle all of that. This is not a seven-step program. And just as we're all different and different things stress us out, I feel like that there's different parts of some of what we talk through here may or may not be helpful. You don't have to apply them all at once. Um, sometimes there are useful gains even in just um, making peace with one or two of these items. For me, the stress comes when I feel out of control. So pulling all of these things together, knowing what's happening in any kind of part of the process or project, um, all of that helps me get some of that control back and reduces my anxiety. So um, I'm hopeful that for all of you, at least one of these elements will offer something to help you get your projects on track and reduce some of that overwhelm and anxiety. I should also point out that if you're already working in project management and are fam familiar with terms like Agile and Scrum, I'm not talking here about applying a particular framework for small projects. Um, this is a talk about some principles that will be familiar to Agilists, even if that term is unfamiliar. Um, but for anyone wanting a deep dive into that, that's a talk for another day and probably actually another conference. So let's look at that first pillar, analyse. So if you're anything like me, when you pick up a new project, you really want to dive in and get on with it. But spending a little bit of time at the top of the project will really help you plan better and will make things like projecting how long things will take and setting milestones a lot easier uh, in the long run. Maybe you're the kind of person who's flailing around feeling as though you, don't, you have so much to do you don't know where to start. This is where you start. Um, you have to know what you're dealing with. You have to start by analysing the project and breaking it down into smaller, usable, manageable chunks. 
uh, in my work with the development team, we create at working on enterprise scale. Anything. It's for the recording. Oh, okay. Dag nabbit. <laughs> this is going to be some fun editing all of this, ha ha you know, housework out for the uh, for the video. Sorry. Um, so in my work with the development team building enterprise scale websites, we create a whole long list of the needs of the project, and break them up into useful, buildable chunks that we call that list of items that backlog. And I want to take my laptop all the way over there now. So the first analysis we do is to identify all the to-do items or features that go into the backlog of the project. And familiar, for those who are familiar with Agile project management, you'll be more familiar with the term user stories. And for the rest of us, let's just think about this as the to-do list. So let's think about a small project of getting on top of your website updates as an example. And here's the list of things that need to be done, and the bigger tasks are broken down into smaller chunks. We start the project with a reasonably comprehensive list of all of the components of that website, but that list isn't static. It changes and it grows as the project does. We may start with all the big chunks, the elements of the site, the user needs, the e-commerce platform, the CMS, WordPress silly, <laughs> um, the content types, and the project progresses as we add more of the detailed items to the backlog. But it's a living document. It flexes as the needs of the project and the needs of the client change. And you'll see there, I've also got this column called effort. And at this point, it may be useful to estimate just how much effort is required for each task. Not so much to estimate how long things will take, but to get an idea of what's a really big task and one that you might have to plan more time for, um, or what's a small one that you can knock out quickly and get it out of the way. Um, I could do a whole session on estimating and how to kind of, not so much predict, but how to plan all of that. But once you start getting into big projects, that, that kind of stuff becomes more important. But it is helpful to just kind of get your head around. So I'm planning this renovation and I know that one of the big tasks is going to be, you know, working out how much I need of what or, or pulling in, you know, getting the roof up or getting the, the frame up. So all of these things, breaking them down to smaller parts, it helps. And knowing which of the parts that are going to require the most effort is also helpful. But of course, this list that we have here is a work-related project. What does that look like for a wedding or a renovation or a holiday? The principles are all exactly the same. Knowing which of the to-do lists are the biggest ones gives you an opportunity to prioritize them or bake them down or delegate or help split them up. Um, but here's the thing that I often see is that we often feel like we just don't have time to be sitting down spending all of this time working this stuff out, analysing this stuff. We just have to get busy and get it done. But doing this now so is going to save you a lot of time in the long run. Um, simply knowing what you're up, up against has the potential to alleviate some of that overwhelm. Is it a... Right, anyway. The other thing that's really useful is that if a lot of the projects you're doing have similar basic needs, particularly if you're building websites that all start off in a similar vein, you can set up a basic backlog like this as a template and then reuse it over and over again and adjust it for every project and stuff that you do. So this part is actually one of my favourite parts of it, of this whole organisation of a project structure. Um, and there are basically so many ways that you can do it, just depending on the kind of way that you operate. So the first one, this is really straightforward. You can write a list. I don't necessarily recommend if you're doing a large-scale project that you write your list on your hand. Um, but just simply writing down all of these things with the checkbox that ticks off as you've achieved and done what you need to do. Um, a notepad, even, you know, old-fashioned paper and pen. I have a, a desk pad and I'm always writing stuff down on that. Sometimes it's just to get it out of my head. I might not even come back to it, but um, writing things down is helpful. How many of you have ever seen one of these before? Awesome. How many of you actually use one? Yes. This is, these are my favourite. Um, this is called a Kanban or a Kanban board. It is the most simple, straightforward way of creating a whole list of tasks that you have to do and tracking how you're going visually. So grab a stack of Post-it notes, 
write your list of tasks on the post-it notes and put them in the to-do column so that you know all of the things that you need to do. And then one by one, as you get all of those tasks done or you are moving them through this process, this is the job that I'm working on now. I've got three tasks that are in my to-do column or doing column at the moment and when you've completed them, move them to done. And there's something really, really satisfying about watching those post-it notes move from one board to the other. I do a lot, of, I work from home, um, we're a remote company and so there's an awful lot of meetings that we do and in the back of, the behind me, I've got a you know, wall of cupboards. My Kanban board is on my wall of cupboards and there's all these post-it notes from one column to the next and I get a little bit of curry if I don't actually, if people don't see things moving. Hey Dee, aren't you doing anything? Hasn't your project moving forward? All of your post-it notes are still in the same place, so... It helps to have a little bit of accountability, though I'm sure not all of us operate in that same way. Um, anyway, it's funny, actually, I've lost count of how many people I've introduced this idea to. I saw Kath nodding enthusiastically there. Um, there's quite a few people that... I mean, I've got a friend who's got these up at home. My sister's got them up at home trying to keep track, you know, hers are all on the front of your fridge. Of how easy this is just, you know, to to write it down. This one's a little bit more of a complicated one. There's obviously a lot more detail of the items that they're doing there, but the process is the same. They're just breaking up their to-do list into a little bit more granular <laughs> prioritising, basically. Um, how many are familiar with this tool? This is Trello. This one is exactly that same thing, but digital. And so if having post-it notes on the wall, if, you know, offends the tidy, neat, clean house that you have. I don't have one of those, so it's not so important. You can actually put it on your, on your laptop and, and your iPhone or your, your um, digital devices and keep track of exactly the same thing. With Trello, you can actually assign them to other people. So if you're delegating work, if you're, you know, have a family and, and you've got different, you can have the whole, t the whole family involved and, and be assigning tasks and I'm sure everybody's going to really love that, but... Um, it helps get all of that that um, challenge of what's going on inside your head out onto something else. Um, this is a, another free tool. This is Asana. Um, this is a simple to-do list in Asana. Um, I've used this with clients. This is a really great collaborative tool. It's a really just a fancy to-do list, but it's another way of structuring and organising your work. And in actual fact, can get quite detailed and even more um, familiar for people that are doing things like um, project and using JIRA or using other boards that have that similar approach to Kanban. Um, you can actually also use boards view in Asana as well. It's definitely worth playing around with if it's just you. Um, you can use it for free. In fact, I think if, there's a, if you've got a small team, you can have a few people involved in that and that's really, really useful. Um, the thing that I did find when I was using this is that if you already have projects in list view, you can't convert them to boards view. You have to start the project with boards for what that's worth. So how many of you are using Git or GitHub to manage projects as well? This is uh, a standard GitHub issues list. Um, the other thing is that, and I know that GitHub has started using boards as well, so again, so that you can get that visual view of columns of the process. Um, this is ZenHub, which is a, an overlay for GitHub as well. So if you want a board's view for your GitHub repository, um, ZenHub is not free. It's free for an open source project. So if it's an open repository, I think you can use uh, ZenHub for free. But if you want it to use it on private projects, then you need to pay kind of per user. But we found that useful, certainly in some of our smaller projects. To, 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 tra to structure and organise the issues in, um, in our GitHub repo. There are obviously a whole lot more tools out there that are also really, really useful. Um, these ones are immediately accessible for home use, pretty much, um, and small business, and so worth checking out. So the next item on that pillar or the list of things is prioritise. And this... In actual fact, this one statement, do what adds value first, is probably, in my opinion, the most important takeaway. When you're working for a client and 
you are putting together your project, you're outlining um, where you're going to go, what you're going to do with this project. The client, the best benefit that you can give to them is to build the things that are going to add value to their business straight away. We dive in and, and we'll have a little bit um, of a look when we go down to the next pillar of iterating. But building something that's actually giving value to the client, even if it's just a landing page and... Uh, an email collection list to start off to actually start giving client something visible and some value before they even actually start seeing their brand new website is an immediate win for your relationship with your client. Um, and certainly if you're... Uh, um, ..building projects that are costing the client a lot of money, if you can actually do parts of that project, and we'll look at that shortly, about pulling in, doing parts that are actually going to help them make money back before they even actually necessarily have finished the project, which is going to sound weird until we look at the next thing. But um, this is my go-to mantra. What are the problem we are solving um, is my first and this is my second. Let's do what's going to add value to them first. And if it's a home project that you're working and your wife has given you a to-do list or your husband's given you a to-do list of all of the things that you need to do, What's the one that's going to get the biggest payoff for her or for you first? That's an immediate win. If it's that I've been waiting for you to paint this thing around the light switch for the last six weeks and you know that just by doing that one simple thing it's going to be uh, a huge win, look at your to-do list and go, which one's going to get the biggest payoff um, is good for everybody. So the, the next item on my list is iterating. Um, so the adding of value spills out using an iterative process. I don't know how many of you are project uh, managers. Have anybody seen this image before? If you think about a website as where from go to woe and the client's relation or your relationship with the client across the top, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I want to see the results, I want to see results, I want to see results, boom, here's your website, yes, results. Whereas if you look at this other process, ooh, okay, I'm building a car, here's going to get, oh, but a skateboard will get me some of the way, a scooter will get me more of the way. You can, the client can see a lot more benefit and value happening throughout the process. So if you translate this into a website project and it's an e-commerce site, well then you can start building your list straight away. Let's build the website, hey, here's a, here's a taste of what some of our products are going to be and start building some interest and some momentum throughout that process instead of just waiting to get everything finished before you launch. Um, you can often find that as users start to get testing and using some of even the features that you're starting to build for their website, you're giving them a much bigger payoff earlier on and they will love you. Um, this is another take on it, or probably a graduation actually. The guy who drew that first image also went on to say, um, aim for the clouds but deliver in small steps actually start giving people stuff that they can test and play with early on, prototype, show them some of the things that they're going to be able to do and be using. Um, satisfy clients, equal more referrals, more projects, and more cash in the bank, which is, of course, you know, as business people, what we want. So one of the tenets of Agile, which is the framework that we use to, to, to talk about um, project management in a lot of cases these days, is that the best measurement of success is actually working software. So if you start getting interested in project management and researching the different method methodologies out there, it can get pretty overwhelming. But I was at a conference recently when I heard one of the original um, people who started Agile talking about it, and his, his process is, let's get back to the heart of it. We're about collaborating, we're about delivering, we're about reflecting and improving and continually um, making better processes and delivering better work in better time and realistically all of those areas that we've covered we will we'll touch at least on one of those core four truths. I haven't dug too deeply into collaborating because for the majority of us we're solo operators if I'm not mistaken. Um, but collaborating and talking a lot more with our clients is something that we see in agile development. Um, Completing, setting a definition of done and measuring your backlog items against it is kind of an extension of the iterative process. But showing completion, and not just a finished site, but completion of features, completion of parts of the process, 
Um, having moments where you've completed the project, whether it's a working feature, a list of jobs ticked off, or moved into the done column on that board, um, there's huge satisfaction in doing that. So in our projects that we're doing, um, we have a set of criteria that each ticket is marked off against, and I'll show you that shortly. And at the end of the sprint, or the end of the short period of time that we've been working on a feature, we'll show the client. And we'll so, show them that it's working. They can get involved, they can go, yes, this is exactly what we wanted. Yes, this is what we wanted, but we think we need to do this or do that or, or iterate or, or adjust it. It's not that the client is only seeing the product at the end of the process. We're having regular meetings and regular talking through. And the team can celebrate some of the wins that they'd had in terms of we've made this really, really tricky piece of software work and the client gets to actually see it in process. So it's hugely satisfying for all of us. And these are the kind of things that we're measuring that against. The feature has been coded, it's been tested by the team, it's been released to the staging environment so that the client can see it, and the product owner or the client side team can actually have a look at it and play with it. And they go, yes, that's exactly what we wanted out of this particular feature, move it to done, and then we can show it all off in the review. So I think we find it really hard sometimes to take those small wins when we're facing a really big deadline or a really big challenge in a big project and we don't feel released to celebrate it until it's finished. I think the review process or getting to the end of each stretch of, of work that we're doing and celebrating that with a review of where we've gone actually gives the team and gives the client something to celebrate. Um, we don't need sparklers and candles to do that really, but... Uh, Seeing the project move forward gives the team something to celebrate, and then seeing them having overcome challenges and deadlines to deliver stuff is hugely satisfying. And it gives you the opportunity to stop beating yourself up that the whole thing isn't done. Um, you can see progress and celebrate that. So at the end of every sprint, for us, that's a two-week period where we set some goals about what we're going to deliver. We work towards delivering that. At the end of that sprint, we review. We go over how that sprint went, and we celebrate with the client that we've We've got this, hopefully, all having gone well, um, that we've got software to show them. But the other really important thing that we actually do at the end of each sprint is reflect. We have what we call a retrospective or a retro meeting, and we look at what went well in that period, what didn't go well, and then what steps are we going to use to take that information and to turn it into improvements for the next sprint. So everything that we build, every process that we go through, every challenge that we come up against and overcome during that period gives us an opportunity to actually learn more and take those skills, those lessons uh, um, into, the next, into the next sprint to do better, to achieve our goals um, at the end of each stretch. The more we're learning and implementing what we're learning into our work, the more there is that sets us apart from the people we're competing against in the market. And that's all seven of them. And again, if you take nothing else away from this, take away this. Do what adds value first, and this. <laughs> Thank you. Obviously, it's a huge subject. There are so many bits of that that you can dive into at a much deeper level. But hopefully, some of those items will be helpful. Are there any questions? Thanks, Bill. My favourite strategy for dealing with those items on the priority list that I actually don't want to do. So there's the perverse part of me that goes, I'll just get it out of the way and do it. But then I'm also asking that question, just how much value does it add? Is it actually helping move this forward? Are there other things that are dependent on that that I can't do until that's done? And as often as not, it'll just be suck it up and get it done. Um, if it's things that I'm really not good at, can I delegate that or outsource that to somebody else is also a question. Um, there's a huge amount of trust in that as to they might hate doing it too and so that, that gets problematic. But yeah, 
I'm probably more likely to be the kind of person that goes, damn it, I'll just get it done and, and do it because it's going to unblock other things. That was easy. We <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Sure. So the question is around iteration. And if you're working in a collaborative environment with the client and they're starting to see what you're building and starting to see other ways that this could help their business or other things that they might want to adjust on that project to deliver different kinds of value or they find that it's going, just tweaking something may actually make them a better website or a, a better project. How do you stop and keep moving on? Do we stop and actually let the client make those kind of changes or do we say, no, let's finish what we started and let's make that phase two, let's do that in the next thing. Um, I don't know if there's any hard and fast process to it. I think you have to be flexible enough to be able to do that because it's the client's project and the client can see a lot more business value a lot of times than we can in some cases, I think. But... Um, it, 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 it does mean having those conversations that say, yes, let, we can talk about this. Let's scope that out and see what that's going to look like. What that means for you is there's going to be some downtime on what we have done. So are you okay with us stopping at this point and spending that time? And again, because it's, we're collaborating with the client, in most cases, if this is really important to them, they will say, yes, I'm fine with you taking a sprint to go exploring what we can do here and how that's going to help and benefit us in the future. It's all just about talking to them and explaining to them what the impact of what they're talking about is actually going to have, I think. I think in some cases it's going to depend on the client. You'll have some, some clients, I think. Um, the project that we're working on at the moment is a terrible example of that because we've been working on it since so October and we still haven't had our first release. So the stuff that we're showing them is little pieces of it and showing them the working pieces or those working features. Um, I think there's gonna, there's a, there'll be all different answers in the room from different people who are doing that kind of thing, and sometimes it will be the client who's can be painful around all of that. I don't know that I have a really good answer. I wonder if anybody else in the room has a response to how you manage bal balancing that client expectation and the pressure that they can end up putting you on showing them stuff too soon. Thank you. How are we going for time? We must just about be wait, two minutes. One more question. Or not. Awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs>